We're primarily focused on finding difference methods for solving differential equations, but in this and the next video I want to talk about two additional methods that have general application in numerical methods. Spectral methods in this video and finite element methods in the next video. Just a very brief introductory discussion so you can get an idea of how they work and how they're different from the finite difference methods that we're focusing on. So first, spectral methods. All of the other techniques that we've been discussing, finite difference methods, finite element methods, finite volume methods as well, they're all local techniques. So you're taking the entire domain and dividing them up into little elements, little cells, uh, little grids. And by doing that, you end up with a large system of algebraic equations having discretized the continuous problem into a discrete problem on all these tiny little pieces. And each tiny little piece is represented by a point or a cell, and that gives you a large system of linear algebraic equations to solve for the approximations of the solution on each of those points or cells or elements. Here I'm going to introduce spectral methods. It's based on the principles of eigenfunction expansions. So that was in chapter three of the Matrix Numerical and Optimization Methods book. You can go back and look at those videos. We're going to take that foundational mathematics and extend it now to a numerical method. It turns out then to be a global method because the basis functions that we're going to use are going to span the entire domain rather than just tiny little pieces of the domain. So it's a global technique. You'll see how that works out in a moment. The primary virtue of spectral methods is that they have very attractive convergence properties. Namely that they have what's called spectral convergence. What that means is the convergence rate is actually exponential. The other techniques we've been discussing have geometric convergence rates. I'll talk more about that by comparison. Spectral methods have exponential convergence rates. And I'll remind you why that's faster. The idea here is that rather than adding more cells or points or elements as we do in the other techniques, now we're going to be adding additional terms to a truncated series expansion that approximates the solution. Now it's based on the method of weighted residuals. That's also the case for finite element methods. So let's say we have a differential equation, LU is equal to F. The script L is the differential operator operating on the dependent variable U, and then F is the right-hand side forcing function. And what we're going to do is expand that unknown solution, U, as a series expansion of these a's times the phi's. And I'll walk you through what all these pieces represent. But it's a truncated series expansion where we have capital N terms. We choose capital N, and as it turns out, we're going to choose these basis functions as well. So we're approximating the solution u as this sum of terms. OK, the u again, that's the approximate solution for the differential equation. The phi sub n's, which you see right here, these are the basis functions, or some call them trial functions. We're going to choose those, and they'll have certain properties. And then the a sub n of t's that you see here in each term, those are the time-dependent coefficients. And I put coefficients in quotes here, because if the problem's not time-dependent, then they're just constants. If it is time-dependent, then these are functions of t. And again, you see those right here. The phi 0, which is this term right here, this is going to be chosen by us in order to satisfy the boundary conditions. And that'll be such that then all of the other basis functions, the phi sub n's, will be zero at the boundaries. So what I want you to notice about the series expansion is that the spatial dependence of the solution is taken care of by these basis functions, which are pre-selected, whereas the time dependence is taken care of by these a sub n of t coefficients those we're going to solve for. So we specify these, and we solve for these for a given number of terms in our series expansion approximation. So that's the expansion for the solution. We're also going to expand the right-hand side function f in a similar way, using the same basis functions, phi sub n as before, but now obviously with new coefficients, a sub n hat. These truly are now just constants because the f is just a function of space, not time. If the basis functions are orthonormal, so they're mutually orthogonal to one another and normalized to length one, then a sub n hat is simply the inner product of f with the basis functions. So for each basis function, you have one of these coefficients that goes in here and gives you a series expansion representation of that right-hand side function f. That's how we're going to represent the differential equation. Now let's think back to the original differential equation, lu hat is equal to f. So u is an approximate numerical solution, u hat is the exact solution 
for the same differential equation. Now because the u itself, which is only approximate, is not going to exactly satisfy this differential equation, we can define the residual. So the residual r will be f minus lu. So remember the differential equation is lu is equal to f, so if u is indeed the exact solution you had, then the residual would be zero. So the closer the numerical solution is to the exact solution, the smaller the residual is. The way we would achieve that in the spectral method is to increase the number of terms. As we increase the number of terms, capital N, our numerical approximate solution will get closer and closer to the exact solution, and the residual will go to zero. So our job now is to determine these coefficients, a sub n of t. All the fees are selected ahead of time, they're known. The a sub n hats are known from these inner products. So the only thing that's not known in our solution is those a sub n of t's. And so we need a technique, we need a method for getting those coefficients. The way we're gonna do that, and this is the weighted residual approach, is we're going to take our residual, we're gonna weight it, so we're gonna multiply it times a weight function, integrate, which is taking an inner product of two functions, and then we're gonna set that equal to zero. So we want the weighted residual to be zero. Or you can think of it as the residual will be orthogonal to the weight function. The weight functions will be w sub i of x. There's different choices for the weight functions. We'll talk about that on the next slide. Some people also call these test functions. I'll refer to them as weight functions. So here's the inner product of r, the residual, with w sub i, which are the weight functions. So remember, the residual represents the differential equation. So f minus lu, inner product with the weight functions, and we're going to set that equal to 0. For functions, the inner product is the integral over the domain of the product of those two functions. So in our case, the residual is f, that's this term right here, minus lu, and that's this term right here. All right, so f is the sum of the a sub n hats times the phi sub n's minus the differential operator L operating on U, which is expressed as the series expansion a sub n's times the phi sub n's, and again, summed up over n terms. Now you notice here, I'm just gonna look at a one-dimensional example here, just to keep things simple. It extends to 2D and 3D, but I'm just gonna look at a 1D example in a moment. So I particularize these to that 1D case where it's only a function of x. And then here you see the weight functions, which again, we don't know what those are. And it's this integral of the residual, this whole thing in squiggly brackets, times the weight function. It has to be equal to zero for all i, from one to capital N. So little n goes from one to capital N, little i goes from one to capital N as well, because we have these two separate functions that are being indexed. Now, as I alluded to a moment ago, there are different weighted residual methods, which determines the choice of the weight functions. One possibility, which is called collocation, is where the weight functions are Dirac delta functions. Remember, Dirac delta functions are zero everywhere. They spike up to infinity at a particular location. Those are the collocation points. Another possibility is called least squares. That's where you take the partial derivative of the residual that we just defined with respect to each of those a sub i coefficients, and that is then the weight function. The reason why it's called least squares is because it's the same as minimizing the integral of r squared, the residual squared, so least squares. The choice that we're going to make, and, the, and a very common choice, is known as Galerkin, and that's where the weight functions are the same as the basis functions. So we originally selected the basis functions, the phi sub n's, or phi sub i's now, and we're going to choose the weight functions to be exactly the same. So w1 is phi1, w2 is phi2, and so forth. That's known as the Galerkin method. This is not an arbitrary choice. This actually has a mathematical basis behind it. Now remember, we're going to select the basis functions such that they are mutually orthogonal. So keep that in mind. So let's look at a simple one-dimensional example, just an ODE. So d squared u dx squared plus u is equal to 0. And we have boundary conditions u is equal to 0 at 0, u is equal to 1 at 1. You could solve this equation very simply because it's a second-order linear constant coefficient equation and it's just a sine function. Put in the boundary conditions and you're done. Uh, but let's do it using the spectral method. So I'm going to choose my basis functions to be sines sine of n pi x 
where n is incrementing from 1 to capital N, capital N being the number of terms that I include in my expansion. And you'll notice that I've selected basis functions that are zero, they're homogeneous, on both ends of the domain. And then I choose my phi zero, remember, such that the boundary conditions are satisfied. Well, it's zero at zero and one at one, so the simplest choice is phi zero is just equal to x, just a straight line. So the job of phi zero is simply to take care of the boundary conditions so that all of the other basis functions can be homogeneous at the two boundaries. All right, so here's the solution. U is then phi zero, which is just x, plus my sum of the a sub n coefficients, and they are just constants now because there's no time dependence, times the phi sub n's, which are my sine of n pi x's, the basis functions. So that's u. Now I need u prime and u double prime to substitute into my differential equation, so let's evaluate those. So u prime, derivative of x is just one, derivative of sine n pi x is n pi times cosine of n pi x, and then u double prime, differentiate again, derivative of one is zero, derivative of cosine n pi x is minus n pi times sine n pi x, so we just end up with minus the square of n pi times sine of n pi x. So I'm gonna substitute this in for u double prime, this in for u into my original differential equation. So that's what we have here, written in terms of the residual. So f minus lu, f is actually zero in this case, and then minus lu, lu is u double prime plus u, so here's the u double prime, and here's the u. So then if I simplify this, these are both just summations in terms of sines of n pi x's, I can put this together, simplify my residual a bit, to be minus x minus the sum over all n of these terms, where I have these a sub n coefficients, which I still don't know, times the quantity, one minus the square of n pi, times sine of n pi x. So remember, I've selected the basis functions, and now we're looking for these a sub n coefficients, which then go back into my series expansion for the solution, and then I'm done. So my goal is to get the a sub n's. The Glurkin method, I choose my w's, my weight functions, to be the same as the basis functions. So wi is equal to phi i. Then I take the inner product of the residual with my weight functions and set that equal to zero. And that has to be true for all i, from one to capital N. So here's that residual, I'll substitute that in. The phi sub n's, those are the sine of n pi x's, and so I get this. So this is the residual in squiggly brackets, and this is my weight function, which is the same as my basis functions, sine i pi x. So I multiply this out, I have an x times sine, I have a sine times sine, so I have those two terms here. So now we need to evaluate these definite integrals. So I have integral from zero to one of x sine i pi x, I can evaluate that, and then I have this integral of sine i pi x times sine of n pi x, and I can evaluate that. Remember the summation here, so this is actually capital N, such integrals where the i's and the n's are generally different. Now here's where the orthogonality of the basis functions comes in. The integral of sine i pi x times sine of n pi x will be zero when i and n are different. When I take that inner product and evaluate that definite integral from zero to one, all of these will be zero because of orthogonality, except when i and n are the same. So of all capital N terms, only one of the terms has a non-zero contribution. So that's gonna get rid of the sum. So let's take a look at these two integrals, this one and this one. And in this case, we're looking at the case where i and n are the same. So here's the integral of x sine i pi x. Look in Wolfram Alpha, back of your calculus book. You'll find this expression here. Put in the limits of integration, zero and one. And it's either one over i pi when i is odd, or it's minus one over i pi when i is even. We can combine these two together by writing minus, minus one the i over i pi where the i-th power of minus one, that's gonna flip the sign back and forth as we go from odd to even, odd to even, odd to even. Okay, then we have the sine squared when i and n are the same. So the integral of sine squared is given by this expression, put in the limits of integration, zero and one, and that evaluates to a half. So if I put that all together back into this equation right here, 
having evaluated those integrals, I simply end up with this expression right here. Remember the summation is gone because I only had one term in the summation that had a non-zero argument. So this then becomes an equation for the a sub i or a sub n coefficients that we're looking for. Solve for ai and we're done. Okay, so I do that. Here's the solution for a sub i. And that's true for all i from one to capital N, depending on the number of terms that I have. I put that back into my summation where I had phi zero plus the summation of the a sub n's times the sine of n pi x's. And so that goes in here. You'll notice I've switched the i's back to n's to keep the notation consistent. All right, so this is my spectral solution to that differential equation. And I can select the number of terms that I wanna keep in this expansion to approximate the solution. Obviously, the more terms I keep, the better approximation it will be. Let's just take one term. Normally, this would be a horrible idea, but let's just take capital N is equal to one, and here is a one-term expansion. And I'm gonna compare that to the exact solution, which is given here, sine x over sine one. And here's that comparison. You notice they're right on top of each other. So the spectral method solution with just one term actually equals the exact solution in this case. Again, that's not normally the case. I'll talk about why that is in a, in a second. All right, so let's make a number of comments. In this case, only small n is required. I only need actually one term because my basis functions, which were sine of n pi x's, are actually the same as my solution. Remember, it was just sine of x. And so we're able to just use one term to get a good approximation. Again, that's not normally the case at all. Normally we'd have multiple terms, many terms, in order to have a good approximation. We'll talk more about the choice of basis functions in a moment. Now you'll notice the basis functions span the entire domain. So those sine of n pi x's, each one is spanning the entire domain. So it's a global solution approach. Now I remarked before that spectral methods give very accurate solutions to our differential equations. That is the case when the solution is smooth. It doesn't mean it's not complicated, but it has to be smooth. It does a very poor job if there's shocks or other very large gradients in the solution. If that is the case, if you do have large gradients, then you're gonna need a huge number of terms. The large capital N is gonna to have to increase tremendously in order to capture that. So the spectral convergence and these highly accurate solutions are obtained when we have smooth solutions. Now let me compare the spectral convergence rate or the exponential convergence rate with what we normally have in our finite difference, finite element, and finite volume methods. In those cases, we have geometric convergence. So that means if we have a first order method or a second order method, third, fourth order method, whatever it is, that scales like one over n to some power. So if it's second order accurate, then that's one over n squared and that is being compared to an exponential convergence rate. No matter what this power is, it's never going to converge as fast as an exponential rate. So that's the beauty of spectral methods. Now in terms of the basis functions, if we have a periodic solution as we did here, then we'll typically choose tri trigonometric functions, sines or cosines, like Fourier series types of terms. If we have non-periodic problems, then typically we'll choose Chebyshev or Legendre polynomials. These are named polynomials because they have special properties, including be being orthogonal over a particular domain. Now, let me remind you of something I said earlier. For steady problems, problems that do not depend on time, the a sub n coefficients will just be constants. And in that case, we'll generally get a system of linear algebraic equations for all of the a sub n's. Here you'll notice I got a simple equation for this 1D linear case but normally we'd have a system of n linear algebraic equations to solve for those coefficients. If the problem is unsteady, such that the a sub n coefficients are now functions of time, then we would get a system of capital N ordinary differential equations in time to solve. So essentially we're converting our PDE to a system of ODEs to solve. If our equation is nonlinear, it's common to use the collocation approach and that's known as the pseudo-spectral method. Pseudo means almost. So when you see that, generally that's being used for nonlinear cases.